Good evening. Last night we talked about I see my Lord a coming. Tonight we talk about I saw my Lord crying. And if you stick with me, this will all this kind of make sense, I think, Thursday night. I hope so. I'd like to start tonight with a question. Do you cry? Do you cry? Well, you know, like at funerals and, and like watching a really sad movie or maybe experiencing some really sad life event, do you cry? I must admit, I do. I cry at funerals. I cry on really sad occasions. Sometimes I cry when I'm overcome by the emotion of the Holy Spirit, when I'm presenting some aspect of the gospel and I'm really convicted of it, and I cry. And uh, there's, there's people in this room right now, tonight, that do the same thing. I know that for a fact. <laughs> Crying or weeping is a completely natural response. A completely natural response to express the emotion of sadness. And whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. But We've all heard this, the macho man never cries, right? Personally, I fail to see anything wrong with crying. And I fail to see anything wrong with a man crying. And the reason why I fail to see anything wrong with a man crying is because Jesus, my Lord and Savior, cried. And I believe this is true. So... So tonight, we're going we're gonna to explore the question of why Jesus cried. We, we want to explore the question of what brought Jesus to tears. Now, our scripture tonight is touted as the shortest verse in the Bible. Most everybody probably knows what that is. John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. I mentioned crying at funerals, and, and I'm guilty of that, uh, even if I don't know the person that well. Not too long ago, I conducted a funeral for the mother of uh, uh, my daughter's, one of my daughter's best friends in high school, and I didn't really know her that well. I knew the... the my daughter's friend very well, but I didn't know her mother that well. But anyway, I was conducting this funeral and I was presenting my uh, gospel message blended with what I could find out about the deceased and, you know, talking to the family the night before. And, and I was feeling no emotion whatsoever. And I looked up and I looked over there at the front row and I saw the family members, and more especially the grandchildren. And they were, they were weeping uncontrollably. They were just, they were obviously very upset. And it, and just, I mean, I just felt tears start streaming down my cheeks. There was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't, I, I had trouble containing myself. Jesus uh, wept in 1135, but if you drop back just a couple of verses to verse 32, uh, we, we see where, well, let me just read the scripture. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, 
my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Notice here that it, it, it's not just the fact that Mary was crying, but the Jews that came with her, they were also grieving and weeping with her. And Jesus was overcome with emotion, and he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Need I remind you that this, we're talking about, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The one that John had spoke of earlier in his opening of his book, where he described <clears throat> as being the one that was with God. And all things were made through him, and not anything was made without him. This was certainly not just a man. This was a God-man. And he wept. He wept with Mary, and he wept, and he wept with the Jews. But Jesus' is weeping here is, is not quite the same as, as the situation I described with myself at the funeral in that in the, in the Jewish culture, while they believe firmly in the resurrection of the righteous, they also firmly believe that when a righteous man dies, the world suffers a great loss. You see, they believe that the world is populated with both good and evil. And when a good person dies, a righteous man dies, the, the scales tend to tip in the wrong direction. So, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, though. They, they still express emotion. They're deeply sorrowful about someone's death just like we are, just same, just as we are in our culture. But there's just a little bit more to it than just a sense of loss and the fact that you, you feel for the family members. In the Jewish culture, it was, it was believed that the entire community suffered a loss. I believe we can glean two things from this instance of Jesus weeping. Jesus demonstrates fully his deep commitment and connection with his Jewish roots. Jesus demonstrates his humanity and how he was so very much like us, like me, like you. That, to me, that's what makes him such a personal Savior. Although uh, John eleven thirty five 35 specifically states that Jesus wept, it's not the only place in the Gospels where Jesus wept. Luke 19, 41 through 44, and when he drew near, and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another if you, in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus was making his final entrance into Jerusalem where he knew, he knew what was in store for him horrible abuse, suffering, death. But that's not what brought him to tears. 
It wasn't because of his faith that he wept, but he knew the fate of the city of Jerusalem. He knew the fate of his people. Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of the holy temple, the house of God, the place where God dwelt, the iconic city of the Jewish nation, God's chosen people, the place where Mary and Joseph had brought Jesus when he was eight days old to have him circumcised, he saw that beautiful, iconic city and that beautiful temple, and he knew it would soon be utterly destroyed. But I don't think his tears were over the building. You see, Jesus knew, he knew the Spirit of God had left that temple. And Ezekiel chapter 9 tells us that. Jesus was weeping because God had returned to that same temple and taught there prophesied there, he healed the sick there, he gave sight to the blind, he opened the scriptures to them, and even raised the dead, yet he was not recognized. God, the God of all creation, had walked in the temple courts with his people once again, and he offered his peace to them, Yet they did not recognize him and rejected him. Jesus knew what was in store for this great city and the temple. He knew that in less than 40 years, over 1 million residents of that city would die. The city would be completely and utterly destroyed because they had rejected God's message. That's why Jesus was weeping. I think more than anything else, he was weeping over the lack of connection with his people, the Jews of Jerusalem. He tried desperately, he tried desperately to connect with them, but they were too hung up on themselves, their rules and their regulations to recognize that the Son of God, the Messiah, had walked among them. Sounds a whole lot like today, doesn't it? I think Isaiah 53.3 describes this very well. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. I think that ties right back to why Christ was weeping at Lazarus' funeral. He was weeping over a lack of connection with his Jewish roots, his people He knew he was about to raise a man from the dead. And and they were going to witness it. But they still were not going to recognize him. He saw into the future and knew the fate of that city, of the temple, and his people. Yet they esteemed him not. I started off tonight with a question, do you cry? And I admitted that sometimes I cry. And we talked about how macho men should never cry. Well, I'm here to tell you, we should be crying. We should all be crying, and we should be grieved over several things. We should be weeping over our sin 
our sin of self-indulgence just like the people of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. We are all guilty of it. And it grieves our Lord. We should be weeping over the sins that exhibit contrition and humility for all offending a just and holy God. The Apostle Paul gives us a very well-written example of the type of godly sorrow we should be exhibiting. Romans 7, 21 through 24. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me this body of death? We should be weeping. We should be weeping over our sin of complacency. You know, complacency is an interesting word to look up in uh, a dictionary or especially a thesaurus. And just look at the synonym. And and I made a little list here for you. Self-satisfaction, self-approval, self-approbation, self-admiration, self-congratulation, self-regard, and self-content. Are we seeing a pattern here? I think it's safe to say we're all guilty of at least one. Or maybe more. Oh, for example, self-content. I think probably we're all we're all guilty of that. God wants us not to be concerned about our earthly lives or our fleshly desires. God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. James 4, 8 through 10. We must constantly, constantly guard against complacency. We certainly don't want to be lukewarm and have the Lord spit us out of his mouth. Revelation 3, 5. We should be weeping over how, in our day, false teaching has become so prolific and leading so many astray. Once again, the Apostle Paul demonstrated a response to us that we should strive to emulate. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 18 through 20. Now, when we read, when we read John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible. We we're often struck with uh, the humanity of Jesus. Maybe now we can view this verse in a little bit of a different light. Maybe now we can consider the deity of Jesus and the fact that he was weeping over his people 
that should have connected with him, but didn't. Perhaps we can realize that Jesus Christ is weeping over some of us, if not all of us, right now. He is weeping because maybe we are not as prepared for him as we think. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for all you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to push aside the enemies of the cross. Help us, Lord, to ignore the desires of our bellies. Help us, Lord, to ignore the things of this world. Remind us, Lord, our citizenship is in heaven with you. May we be ever mindful of the fact, Lord, that you are coming again. And may we all be eagerly waiting for that coming. We know, Lord, you are weeping for us. And if there is anyone here tonight that feels the need to weep with you, Lord, I pray your spirit will fall upon them and nudge them in the right direction. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It all starts with a godly sorrow that produces repentance, which leads to salvation. This season, this time of the church year, is the most appropriate time to reflect on your own personal situation and consider something. Consider what Jesus Christ did for you. Not only did he weep for you, but he bled and died for you. And I thought it was appropriate that that was in Johnny's, one of the lines in Johnny's song. Ask yourself, who am I that he would bleed and die for? Jesus bled and died for you. Will you weep with him? Will you repent in godly sorrow and weep with him? The altar is open. As we, as we sing our final hymn, the altar is going to be open. If you feel the need, if you feel the need to come and pray, you want someone to pray with you, Margaret is available. Andrew is available, Tony is available, I'm available. Anyone in here that feels the need to pray, anything, anything you need, come.